So uh, today I'm not going to talk to you. I'm tired of talking to you. Oh, I'm just kidding. Uh, this week, Brandis Wilson came to me, and uh, and uh, if you guys don't know Brandis, she's our children's pastor here, and and uh, her husband Chris was my friend. He was my disciple. He was uh, he was my partner, and uh, and uh, we lost him. And he used to he used to speak for me uh, pretty regular. And, and uh, and we lost Chris in February, and uh, and uh, he left a hole in me and and in the church, and and uh, you know it's been tough. It's it's been tough, and uh, but Brandis has come a few times, and God's speaking to her, and I, I believe that she walks under Chris's mantle, and uh, and uh, if you've ever heard her speak, it's just unbelievable. I'm not trying to put her on the spot. I know she, she's, she's nervous. It, it's good to be nervous when you speak on behalf of God. It's a, it's a good thing. Uh, I, I'm nervous every time I stand up here. So if I'm ever not nervous, I'll know something's very, very wrong with me. So uh, uh, she came to me this week and she had had a vision and she'd been, God had been showing her things and, and uh, revealing stuff to her. I'm not going to teach her a message for her. Uh, so I said, and, and I will say this on occasion, you're going to talk about that Sunday. <laughs> Be careful what you tell me. <laughs> and uh, she said, I don't know if I'm ready. I said, oh, see, that's the problem is we have to get ready. Uh, you know what Peter's most effective message was? 3,000 people at Pentecost. You know how long he had to prepare? Uh, about three minutes. God spoke. Peter stood up and addressed the crowd, and 3,000 people's lives were changed. So I, I told Brandis that, to, that uh, our goal here is not to perform. It never is. If you've been here and you've heard me speak, you know that's true. <laughs> we don't perform, but we do share what God's sharing with us. And I believe that God has given our church a word through Brandis today. So I want to introduce to you Brandis Wilson. Yes, I am very nervous, and so I hope I don't walk around too much or do anything to bump this and make crazy noises, but I'm thankful that Todd already kind of told you a little bit about my situation, and it goes along with my message, and <clears throat> see, sorry, um, God started showing me something at the beginning of the summer, and um, I was drawn to reading Kings, and I don't know why, really, and so I was like, that was kind of weird, and so I even asked Kim and Celia, I was like, hey, you know, have you read about this, and of course they're like, yeah, but they didn't say, oh, yeah, that's so awesome, blah, 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 they, you know, didn't get really excited, so I was like, all right, whatever, so I kind of put it away, that was the beginning of June, early July, I started reading about it again, and I was wondering, God, what is in this? Again, I go to Cillian and Kim, and I'm like, no, I just keep having these questions about this one really short paragraph and verse, and I don't understand. And so I put it away because, well, I just did. And when God wants to get your attention, he's going to get it. And, well, in the middle of July, my daughter ended up in the hospital for a week, and well, let's just say I had plenty of opportunity to read and ask God questions and hear from him because my daughter didn't want to talk to me after a little while, and my friends got kind of bored on the phone with me because I my scenery didn't change. I was just in the hospital. So through all of that, um, well, it was just me and God. 
And it turns out that I'm so thankful for that time. I am not thankful that my daughter was in the hospital by any means, but since she's good and healthy and great, we're, you know, moving on. So that was the, how this all got started, and that's why when this triggered on this week, it just was huge because it had been building up all summer long. Has, any, has that happened to anybody here? God just starts showing you something little by little, and then when you're finally ready for it, he just slaps it down on you, and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? So um, Monday was my anniversary, mine and Chris's anniversary. So needless to say, it was a very hard day Monday. Um, we sat around here and cried a lot. Um, but there's healing in tears, and I believe that. And so there was a lot of healing going on on Monday. Yes. Um, so Monday night, you know, I'm exhausted. I've cried all day. And, you know, that real ugly kind of cry where your eyes are real swollen and your face is all splotchy. That was me Monday night. And so I'm getting in bed, and... It's 1030, and all of a sudden, God says, remember Elijah and Elisha. I was thinking, what? And so it's 1030. So usually, I love my sleep a lot, especially if my little ones are asleep. I'm in bed. Um, So when he says that, I think, what does that mean? Well, I remembered my journey over the summer. And so when he said that, I I remembered my notes from the hospital, and so I thought, I wonder where those notes are. If you know me, you know, usually I'd say, eh, I'll wait till in the morning. We'll check that out later. But God said no. So 1030 at night, I'm digging through all of my junk from the hospital because, again, if you know me, it's all still crammed in a corner in a bag, and it's stayed over there for a long time. So I'm digging, and I can't find it, and so I'm digging some more, and I'm tearing my room apart looking for this little bitty journal that I had used in the hospital. And finally, I find it. So now we're, you know, looking at 11, almost 11.30, and I'm grabbing my stuff. I grab my spiral, grab my journal, grab my Bible, and I go to um, find out what it is that God wants to show me. And let's just say he laid it on so thick that I ended up staying up almost all night long writing, and I couldn't write fast enough. Has that ever happened to you? You're writing, and you're just like, I should just stop writing and start recording this, because I have no idea what's going on. Um, My notes are all crazy. They make no sense, but they did in that moment, and that's all that matters. So I woke up the next morning really super early, because now I'm pumped up, because God's speaking, and I'm excited, and I want to hear what he has to say to me. And so I wake up really early, and I hear a message from somebody else, and it's clicking with this stuff that God is showing me. And so I'm thinking, what does this mean? Oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. And so I just can't wait to get to work. But on my way here, I started doubting the things that I had heard. So I started thinking, well, I'm just not going to tell anybody until I know more. I'm not going to tell anybody until I'm sure that that's what I really heard, until I have major signs, because keeping me up all night was not a big enough sign. So anyways, I come and Celia and I were talking, Kim, and all of a sudden it just starts spilling out, and that's how we laid up to this. And so it is in 1 Kings, or did I say 2 Kings? Let me look. 1 Kings 19, 19 is where all of this started, and it's just a really small verse, but it's so big. And so I really hope that I do an okay job sharing what God showed me. Um, so if I jump around, somebody raise your hand or stand up and say, you missed that part, can you go back? Okay, Um, so I'm just going to start here in 1 Kings. Um, Right before this, Elijah, and I have to enunciate really good because Elijah sounds like Elisha, and I don't know why they're like that in one story. Anyway, so Elijah was told by God to go after Elisha, and up um, in 1916, It tells that he, um, Elijah, needs to anoint Elisha to succeed Elijah as the next prophet. A prophet is someone in the Old Testament who heard from God and had just this direct contact and was able to hear and tell the people about what God wanted to say. So that's a pretty big deal. So in 1919 it says, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha. And I don't know how to pronounce some names, so I kind of skip over them. 
He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and he went back and he took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, and he burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. And they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah, and he became his servant. So this is where, at the beginning of July, where he, you know, I'm thinking, well, that's kind of odd. Why would he burn all of his stuff? And so, you know, that kind of seemed pretty dramatic to me. So that was one of my questions. And so I, you know, have all these notes in my Bible. Do y'all write in your Bible? Do you know you can? It's okay? It's good? Because then you can go back and look and say, oh, my gosh, that's so cool. I've already been thinking about this stuff. Um, okay, so in this passage, there's so much stuff that God was showing me. Um, the first thing is that this prophet came after Elisha, and he takes his cloak, and he tosses it on his shoulders. And the thing with the cloak is a representation of Elijah's mantle, the anointing that he has walked under, he's passing on to the next prophet. And so I'm wondering, you know, as I'm reading, what is Elisha thinking? But it doesn't look like he thinks at all. He just runs after Elijah. He just chases after him like he's ready to go. Like they didn't even need to speak any words to each other. They didn't have to discuss what this plan might look like, what we might have to go through. If it might work, if it might not work, you might be a good fit to be a prophet, you might not. I don't know, let's check it out. No, that didn't happen at all. He just takes off after him. But he does ask Elijah one thing. And he does say, can I go back to say goodbye to my family? I'm not really sure what Elijah was thinking, but it sounds like he's probably thinking along the lines of, really? Do you know what I just did? Do you realize that I just anointed you to follow under my footsteps and be a prophet? And you want to go say goodbye? So, I don't know what happened after that, if Elijah kept, just kept walking. But I do know what it says that Elisha does. And Elisha goes back and he burns his plowing equipment. He burns the oxen. And in culture in this time, that means a burnt offering, a burnt sacrifice was a very big deal. So he takes that and he feeds everyone. And when I read that he burned his equipment, do you realize what that says to me? There was no turning back. There was no going back. There was no thinking, is this a good idea? Do I really do it? He just jumped in. He ran after Elijah. He burns all of his stuff. And then it says right there at the very end that he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. So, sounds like a really big deal at this point. Um, so I've got all these questions and God never fails. He never fails to allow me to ask question after question and he shows me the answers because he loves me and he wants me to have the answers to these questions. And so, um, you're wondering, possibly, how does this have anything to do with us? How does this have anything to do with me? Well, you see, Elisha was doing what he did. His ordinary, everyday life, he was following his oxen, he was plowing the field. Possibly a field that didn't even necessarily belong to him, but a field, no less, that he had to work day in and day out. It's the same thing. Does it sound familiar to anyone to have an ordinary life? Day in, day out, you go to work, you take the kids to school or vice versa sometimes. And so you get them to school, you come home, do dinner, do bath, go to gymnastics. Again, reverse that order. And then you go to bed just to wake up to do it all again the next day. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. 
And more than likely, if you came from a past where I came from, that's probably really good. But it's ordinary. God doesn't create us to live ordinary. He didn't create us to live a life of just getting through, waiting till the next day. He created us for something even more than that. And that's what is very exciting to me and that God started to show me. Sorry, let me flip here so that I know where I'm going. Um, so he tells Elijah, or Elisha's following after him, and he just lets go of everything that he has. So as I'm talking, I want you to think a little bit about things that you have that you could be letting go of, because this is all going to make sense, hopefully, to you at the end. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about my testimony. I believe in the power of testimony. I believe that it is through our testimony that we can share with others that things will start to happen because God has given us a story. And it's not my story, which is why whenever Todd said, I think you need to tell this on Sunday, at first I said, well, God gave this to me. And I would like to keep it because he gave it to me. I stayed up all night waiting for it. But it's not for just me. It's for all of us. Um, and it goes along with how hot are you willing to be. So my story is that I loved my husband from the day I met him. Very first day I met him, kid you not, I was in love. We were only 16 years old. So you can imagine that in that time, we've gone through a journey. Ups, lots of downs, ups and more downs, but it was a journey together. Our transformation happened three and a half years ago. Seems so much longer, but I guess the good definitely outweighs the bad. So three and a half years ago, our life was completely changed. Our life went from destruction and chaos into something really good. It was ordinary. We went to church, we went to work. Since his work was here, he was here a lot. If we were together, we were usually here. And it was good because you don't understand where we came from, that this was so good. We did a lot of things together. Um, when I wasn't able to be here, I was at home taking care of our babies. And I would be at home, he would be here. We would hook up at night, and it was dinner, bedtime stories, making sure homework was done, bath time, get the kids in bed, and it usually was really chaotic and crazy, to the point that when they were finally asleep, we were like, oh my goodness, thank you, Lord, that you let them go to sleep very easily, because now I can just sit down. So you see, it's good. And I enjoyed it. Sure, I complained a little bit about, can't we just do something? I'm bored. And so when we thought about getting wild and crazy, we would go to Mesquite and go out to dinner and then shop at Mardell and then complain because we spent too much money at Mardell. My husband loved to go to bed around 9 o'clock-ish, and that was a late night, and so we didn't get too wild and crazy, but it was good. And so you see... Through all of this, I'm telling you that my life was good. It was ordinary. It was routine. A lot like what Elisha was doing. It was good, but it was regular. It was ordinary. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you have a regular, ordinary life? Is it good? And you're like, well, this is better than what it could be. But do you feel like there's more? See, that's what God showed me is there is more. And he wants to just shower us with the more. The thing is that we have to go through a process to get to the more. Um, so we go through and we're living life. My husband was um, awesome. He was web designer up here, preacher, teacher, friend. He was husband, he was daddy. He did all his roles well. And I'm thankful that I got to have those three and a half years to remember and to pass on to my children opposed to the chaos. 
But you see, February 17th happened. It was a day that changed everything for me. You see, the previous September, I went to a Joyce Meyer conference with my friends, and I heard God very clearly tell me, your ministry, because I was struggling. My husband had a great, fast-track ministry, and I was like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. So I was struggling, but God very clearly at that conference told me, your ministry is your husband first and your children. I said, God, I got this. I can handle that. And so I was excited that I had a clear word from God what I was supposed to do. I didn't have to worry about making a ministry because I already had it. So when February came, it shook everything that I had ever believed. Because God is good, right? So if he's good, how did he take this man who knew me better than I even know myself? How does he take this man who is everything to my children. How does he take this guy who was doing so much for the love of God for other people? It didn't make sense. But the one thing that I do know, the one thing that I do count on, are the words that Chris told me in the very end, and it's that God loves us. What does that look like? Well, I don't know exactly. But I know that I'm covered in his love, I'm covered in his grace, and his mercy. Because without it, I promise you I wouldn't be standing here right now to tell you any of this. And that is why I'm so humbled that I even get to share this picture with you. So February happens, and I'm lost. I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. I don't know where I'm supposed to go next. But you see, the other great thing that we just sang about is the author of time has created us. He knew every hair on your head before you were ever even born. Do you know how much time he took to make sure you were exactly the masterpiece that he wanted you to be, to do the work that he wanted you to do? So in knowing that, in knowing deep in my soul that he created me with a very specific purpose, I trust him. And so in trusting him, I ask him, God, what do you want me to do? And that's why Monday he started showing me again about Elisha and his plow. Because you see... Elisha didn't think twice about burning his plow. He did it, and when he did it, he gave. And then he was ready to follow. He was ready to be a servant. He was ready to walk up underneath somebody to learn everything that this prophet before him had to share. And so that excited me. You see, I don't know how it could get any better than my marriage with Chris. I don't know how... I could go from what I was living to something better. To me, my mind, that doesn't make any sense. But, but I trust God. What does that look like sometimes? Sometimes we're in our deepest, darkest. You're like, how do you even trust God? What do those words mean? Those make no sense to me. And I understand. They don't. And that's why when I don't understand, he gives me that one word and he says, trust. And then when I say I don't understand that word, well, he's ready to hold me in his hands. He's ready to guide me and show me. Because he has it already all planned out. What looks like to me, like he's making it up as he goes along, he's not. He's not sitting in heaven saying, I think that we need a little entertainment around here, so let's change up what the plan is. No, his plan has never changed. His plan is for you to live in his love, to walk in his grace, and to spread that with all of his children. It's not for you to keep it to yourself. It's for you to share. So how hot are you willing to get for him? It's a big question because it's going to cost you something. You're going to need to burn your plow in order to follow him. You're going to need to burn your plow and chase after him and ask him, what is your plan for me? Because your plan is so much greater than I could ever imagine. And so I asked that question, which was really hard. 
And he showed me that my plow that I was going to need to burn, that I was going to need to let go of in order to walk in his love and his grace. I was going to have to let go of how I pictured my life going. I had to let go of lifting my husband up, him being the leader, me following. That's not something that I like to think about. But it's something that I have to do. And he showed me. And he didn't show me in a harsh way. It was a beautiful way that he showed me. Because while I have to burn my plow, he's got something greater. I get to walk into something even more. Believe me when I tell you I don't see how that's possible. But you're sitting here, and I know that as I've talked about a plow, something's come into mind. There are many, many ways that we could have a plow. You see, the plow, what it does is it holds us to our past. So a plow can be an emotion or it can be something physical. It can be your unforgiveness. It can be your bitterness, your anger. It can be something material like your car, your finances. Just a quick story. Um, we had, you know, back in the day, all your big, big books that had all your CDs in them, and you would take all this time to put your CDs in order, and you would keep the covers all nice and neat in them, and you were really proud of this huge collection of CDs that you were going to get to show everybody that you had. Well, we had lots of books of CDs, and one day, we were at the gas station pumping gas, and Chris just threw them in the, dump in the dumpster, and we drove off. And I was wondering what that was about, and he said, well, he said, we don't need them, we don't need to listen to that kind of music anymore. You see, it wasn't the music necessarily, it wasn't anything about that, but that music took us back to our past. That music kept us in our past, and we were no longer those people. We didn't walk in that old life anymore, so why carry around something that represented the old life? And in Chris's way, you just toss it out and drive on. So your plow could be something physical or it could be something emotional. Um, it's not going to be easy to burn your plow. Or it could be. Because look at Elisha. His was easy. He burned his plow and he ran after the God who created, or he ran after Elijah who had a plan that God had told him. God spoke to Elijah. God told him, go after Elisha. Well, here's the really awesome thing. You can flip over in your Bible or your phone, if you want to, to um, John 16. And it says in verse 7, Very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And I didn't mean to go into all of that because I just wanted this top part. That verse, what color is it in? Red. So who says that? Yeah, y'all can say, Jesus, isn't it a beautiful name? Get excited about his name and all that comes with it. So Jesus said, I have to go away. He's telling his disciples that he has to leave. And I'm sure they're sad. But it's because there's something greater that is going to come when he leaves. So that verse spoke to me in a way that Chris had to leave. It wasn't my plan, but God already has a plan. He created the plan for Chris, and he created the plan for me, and he created the plan for my children. So he's already got it out this far in advance, so why should I be concerned? Does my flesh hurt? Absolutely. Do I miss him? Most definitely. I can't even tell you how much. But just like Jesus says here, greater things are coming. So then... With the Holy Spirit coming upon you, what is that? Just like Elijah threw his cloak on Elisha, Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit to walk in his authority, walk in his grace. 
You see, we've been given a mantle. We've been anointed as his chosen children to walk in this. So are you walking in it? Are you living with the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you so hot that you go out amongst your friends and it's just contagious? It's like a wild wildfire just consuming everybody around you. Or are you just ordinary? Are you just, okay, I love God, and, you know, you have the bumper sticker, and you wear the shirts, and it looks good, and it's ordinary? Or are you so hot that you cannot be contained? You see, we have to burn our plow in order to get to that place. We have to be willing to sacrifice the things of our nature to move forward. I'm so glad that we get to come here together. I still ask God why. But he showed me yesterday another picture. I asked him why. Why did this happen? Why is it happening like this? Why couldn't your plan be different? And then I was shown the picture of my little boy Gavin. And right now he's two. And he goes through the repetitive stage right now. And he is asking me question after question after question. And I give him the same answer every time. But it doesn't mean that he's not going to ask that question again. But I never tire of telling him over and over the answer that he needs. Because I love that little boy so much that I will tell him over and over until he moves on to something else or until he gets what he needs. And that's exactly what my God does. Every time I ask him why, over and over, he's got me. He's got my answer. It hasn't changed. It's still because he's got a plan. But he answers me over and over. And because he loves me so much, he shows me the things that I have to burn, the things that I have to get rid of in order to move forward into the greatness that he has for me. You see, keeping my hand on what I thought my life was going to look like, keeping my hand on that plow is going to keep me over there. And he doesn't want to keep me over there. He wants me to move forward. He wants me to walk in the greatness that he has created me for. And he has that exact same plan for each and every one of you. It was no accident that you came to this place today. It is no accident that we are here together. We come to this place to gather, to encourage each other, to equip each other and share our testimony, to share our stories of the love of God so that we can take it out there. It is not meant to stay in this place. You see, this is where we come to lift each other up. And then we get to take it out there to his children who don't want to come here, who don't know how to walk through those doors. But when they see your love, when they see the love of God flowing through you in that big, big way, they say, I want to know that God. I want to know why you are how you are. And there's only one explanation because it's not me and it's not you. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the mantle he has given you to walk in. So I just ask that you think about what is your plow. What is it that you're keeping your hand on? What are you keeping there for just in case this doesn't work? What are you keeping your hand on to think of my past? It could be good. It could be okay. It could be something that's not really that bad. But he could have something even greater. So, just ask yourself, what's your plow? I shared my plow story. And so, think of yours. And then, be ready to share it. <laughs> Don't keep it to yourself. So, I just want to pray for you.